Hello, Houston. We're just kind of playing around with the computer here today, trying to remember where we were going to be to start today, and I think I've finally found the spot, so we'll um, start hopefully with a window I'm going to put up here for you in just a second, and we can get launched here. This is what's called planning ahead, which we didn't quite do, but that's life. Um, so, in any case, while you're starting to snooze, that's in fact exactly what we're going to be talking about today, which is basically sleep activity. Give me just a second to get organized, and we're off to the races. Um, we need to make that a full screen, and then we're going to tell the system to... I'm not blind here, that that's... There we are. We're ready. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. We had talked last time about sleep, and in essence, um, today what we're going to do is, is step in and look at what's involved in, in the study of sleep. Um, the major thing that had to be awaited were two events in order for us to, um, to, actually, um, to actually study sleep. One of them was the, um, the development of a computer, and the other was a means by which to measure the EEG, or the, the electrical activity of the, um, of the brain. Um, in order to, um, to look at that, let's have a look at, um, whoops, that's not what I was expecting to have happen here. We're having, um, I know what the difficulty is, we'll just do it on simple psych and be done with it. Um, the electroencephalograph basically has a standard map, a kind of a sideways view of the head with specific attachment sites on 12 points on each side of the head. All of those are fed into something called an electroencephalograph, or EEG. Um, the EEG essentially measures electrical activity in a given area of the brain. And when you do that, um, some rather amazing things happen. In your simple psych book there on the first page of, the, of Physio 3, you will notice that there's about a six or seven line graph there that depicts various parts of the um, various kinds of electrical wave activity. At the top, is a line that shows the normal waking activity, a fairly low amplitude, high frequency wave. One of my um, former colleagues, now deceased at the U of H, uh, was actually among the first to demonstrate that some of those waves actually range up to as much as 42, 43 cycles per second. So there's a lot of electrical activity going on in the brain at any given time in the normal alert awake state. When you start to fall asleep, the first thing that happens is that you move into what we call stage one. Stage one is dominated by alpha waves, which are basically low amplitude, high frequency uh, waves that range about up to about six to eight cycles per second. They're much slower than what's going on when you're alert and awake. But it turns out those are called alpha waves. Keep those in mind because we're going to come back and look at those a little bit later today when we address uh, med meditation. Um, because in essence what happens in meditation is that you put yourself into what's called an alpha state. When you do that as you're falling asleep, if we lift your arm up off the table or the, the desk and re the, the bed and release it, the very act of lifting it up will be enough to wake you up again. So in essence anybody who's in alpha stage or stage one when asked were you asleep would essentially say no I was just drifting and that's about all. But it is, in fact, dominated by alpha waves. Muscle tone is relaxed, but it is still there. Um, the next stage is stage two. Now what's happening is that the alpha waves are giving away to two other kind of phenomena. One is what's called a sleep spindle. And you'll notice a couple of instances in the stage two wave in your text there where there's a very high frequency wave that is superimposed upon the other wave activity that is occurring. In the ideal form, which we don't have diagrammed in the book there, it looks almost like a side view of your grandmother's spindle when she's winding yarn onto it. Okay? The needle essentially starts small, gets larger, and then gets smaller again. So you have almost a spindle-like activity when you look at it. <laughs> the other thing that is beginning to occur in stage two is the presence of what are called delta waves. Delta waves are much larger amplitude, very slow waves that range um, around two to four cycles per second, and they are just beginning to show up in stage two. In stage two, if we lift your arm off the bed and release it, it will fall back. Um, you're very relaxed, but in fact there is still a little bit of muscle tension uh, still present. But now if we awaken you, you would report, yes, in fact, I was asleep, once we see the spindles and the beginnings of, of delta waves. In stage three and stage four, the only difference between those two stages is the amount of delta waves that are present. 
If it's, at a, it, if it's less than 50% delta waves, it is considered to be stage 3. If it's greater than 50% delta waves, it is considered to be stage 4. In both of those instances, if we lift your arm up off the bed, it falls back as absolutely dead weight. There is no muscle tone present at all. This, interestingly enough, is also the stage, particularly stage 4, in which you will engage in sleepwalk. But when we get to the next stage, you do not sleepwalk. The, the next stage that occurs, the last one down on the, on the diagram in the, in the simple psych book there, is what is called emergent stage one or REM sleep. It's also sometimes referred to as paradoxical sleep. The paradox being that as you can see from the electrical record there mimicked in the book, it's exactly the same as if you're wide awake. And interestingly enough, the graduate student who originally conducted this research um, took the apparatus home once it had been developed and plugged it up to his uh, eight or nine year old son and then the graduate student watched and, and monitored the equipment while his son slept and he noticed without really going to check with his son that gee it's interesting he seems to wake up every couple of hours uh, at night and he didn't really think about it but then he began to realize that it was happening with a fair degree of regularity and so he actually took the trouble to go in and look at the the participant his son and discovered that in fact when the record looked like he had actually awakened he had not in fact, the muscle tone was still totally gone. I mean, the, the youngster was totally, completely relaxed, but was manifesting a waking stage, a sleep pattern. That's the paradox and the reason that this stage is sometimes called paradoxical sleep. It's a paradox because you've got the, the waking state, but in fact, you're totally asleep. Then he noticed, as he watched his son more carefully, that in fact, his, uh, his son's eyes were moving. And that is what has led to the phrase REM sleep or rapid eye movement. REM stands for rapid eye movement. And REM sleep or that, those rapid eye movements only occur during what is now called emergent stage one or the REM sleep stage. It turns out if you awaken somebody from emergent stage one, they will report in the high 90s percent of the time that they were dreaming. So we now know that emergent stage one actually identifies dream state, not sleepwalking, but dream state. And the eye movement turned out to be very instructive in beginning to understand what is actually going on when you're dreaming. Because of course the, the idea was that, well, you, or some thought that you could actually uh, do the dreams just in microseconds, that is that they would just flash by and then you could kind of unpack them later. Doesn't turn out to be true. Uh, we actually dream in real time. That is, the dreams are occurring in our head in exactly the same rate as we would be living the experiences if we could. Um, it was another thought that went absolutely right out of my head there. Terribly relevant, I'm sure, but it'll come back to me. In any case, um, the other thing, oh, I know what it was, and that is that some people think they don't dream, but in fact they do. Um, there's a very nice book by Anne Faraday called The Dream Game that's about 30 years old now at a minimum. It's a paperback, but it's a very nice couple of hundred pages of information on what dreaming is all about, a variety of different philosophical approaches to it, and even very helpful hints on how to go about impacting the dreaming that you're doing. For instance, to make yourself aware of it, what Faraday recommends is that what you do is to set your alarm clock so that for about 14 days or so, you always wake up at exactly the same time. And then on the 15th or 16th or 17th day, move the alarm about 10 minutes earlier. And she essentially guarantees that you will find yourself dreaming when you do so. That is, that once you get your sleep regularized, um, the cycles then tend to fall at very predictable patterns. And the, the emergent stage one sleep um, tends to occur or only will occur after you have been in stage three and stage four. That is the reason it's sometimes called emergent stage one is because it emerges out of stages three and four. That was the source of one of the teases that I gave you way back at the beginning of the semester. You'll remember we had a cat riding along on a belt which would dump the cat into water if it didn't wake up. It was a great big cage that was about half water and half moving belt. And the result was that the cats could, as cats usually do, sleep, snooze, could hunker down on the far edge of the belt, but it was riding constantly toward water. Few of the cats got wet, but they very quickly realized that when their feet started tipping as the belt was going over the edge of the roller, they needed to wake up and walk back to the far end of the cage. And so they could snooze for about 10 minutes. What that meant in terms of the stages that we were just looking at is that they could, they could not dream. That is, they were not sleeping long enough at any given point in order to be able to actually dream. 
And the question then was, do they actually have to dream? Well, there are two answers to that. The one is that basically they were not sleep disturbed. That is, they were, st they were still sleeping as much as they normally did. So they were not actually sleep deprived in this experiment, one point. But the other is they were in fact dream deprived. And the net result was that when the, when the experiment was terminated, that is when cats were put back in their home cage instead of the one that was constantly moving them and causing them to wake up, what happened was that where cats will normally dream about 15% of the time, these cats rebounded and were now dreaming about 60% of the time in the hours immediately following being in the, um, the moving cage. <coughs> so there is in fact a deprivation that builds up if you are not allowed to, um, to dream enough so that we do in fact have to dream. Um, another thing that turns out to be interesting is that the, the dreams occur on about a 90 minute cycle. About every 90 minutes you will dream again and the cycles get longer as the night goes on. So in essence the first cycle may be a short one, only 10 or 15 minutes, about an hour and a half after you fall asleep. The second one is a little bit longer. The last one, about the fourth or fifth or sixth one that you get into, depending on how long you're allowing yourself to sleep, um, may last as much as an hour or more at the end of the night. That's the one that mom usually wakes you out of, right? And that's the one that also leads into some other things about is it possible to, to um, impact the nature of the dreams? And the answer is yes. Under certain conditions, you can actually engage in, in guided dreaming, particularly if, if it's late at night and you're, you're um, uh, trying to, to uh, shape that you, you know how you want, you're alert enough that you know how you want the dream to t turn out. You can, in fact, in some cases, guide the dream under those, um, under those conditions. The other point about the, um, about the dreaming that I did want to indicate is that the nature of the eye movement actually follows the content of the dream as you are imagining it, as you are living it. Uh, one of the early reports was a subject whose eyes were doing this, and you'll have to kind of zero in on me in the booth to see what I'm doing, and I'll accentuate it a little bit with my head. But in essence, their eyes were doing this constantly. Now, my eyes aren't moving that much in my head, but the eyes under the eyelids were doing this. What did they report that they were doing? A tennis match, exactly. They, were on a, they had a side view of a tennis match that they were watching. Another one, there were actually two reports where the eyes did this. One of those reported that he was climbing a ladder to fight a fire, and so he was watching the rungs of the ladder go past in his dream. And in the other instance, it was reported that the person has imagined that he was hammering a nail. I would suspect that he hurt his thumb because normally when you're hammering, you don't watch the hammer, you watch the nail. Okay, but in fact, he was watching the hammer as he dreamed. Um, the magic of being able to hit the nail without looking at it, I guess. But in any case, that was what led us to understand that in fact, dreaming occurs um, real time. It is necessary as sleep is also necessary. Now, let's go to the, uh, We'll go to the, um, the screen here and now see if the, the magic PowerPoint will in fact actually work. It turns out I loaded the same program twice, hence I had no slides when I was just talking about. That's life. When we talk about meditation, we lead into a state defined as yoga or a union. It's essentially a kind of, it's described as a higher consciousness that is achieved when a fully rested and, and relaxed body encounters a fully alert and rested mind. Um, in essence, in order to, to create the state, there are a couple of things that you have to do. Basically, uh, there is a standard session that was actually used by Wallace and Benson in a report that was done initially back in, in Scientific American way back in 1972. And what they did was to study, a, they measured a number of physiological features of, of somebody who was actually meditating. They used um, um, standard uh, yoga um, in, the, in the technique and in, in essence in using transcendental meditation, which is the phrase I meant to use, um, they went through four stages in the experiment that they, um, that they conducted. The first stage was a 30 minute period during which people simply habituated to the, uh, to the room that they were actually in. In other words, essentially just relaxed in the room that they were actually in. The second stage involved a 20 to 30 minute period of relaxation and basically pre-meditation, kind of getting ready to actually meditate. The third stage was a 20 to 30 minute session of actual meditation where the, the subjects, the participants were encouraged to, to meditate as as they normally did. And the final stage then was a post-meditation stage during which the subject was asked to, to stop meditating and essentially bring themselves back to their normal alert and awake um, state. 
What Wallace and Benson measured here was things like blood pressure, the heart rate of the, of the participants, their temperature, their skin resistance, a measure called galvanic skin response, and also their EEG at about 10 minute increments. And they got some rather amazing results out of this. What they found was um, that basically there are several very predictable changes that occur when you and I meditate or when anyone meditates. One is the fact that the, the, um, the biggest surprise was that um, subjects uh, meditating could actually produce a marked increase in, in slow waves, that is in alpha waves. Always before, psychologists had simply been skeptical of reports from, from the, the Far East that people could actually get into this kind of wondrous meditative state. And it was simply, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it doesn't exist. Well, in fact, it does. And we can voluntarily put ourselves into what is called alpha state, where we are, predict, we are, we are encouraging ourselves, allowing ourselves to produce alpha waves as we, as we label them in, in the EEG, that this can be done. But there were some other findings that also came out of this. Question. Okay, comment. Go ahead and get on mic. I've read several, I've read several articles in the past that say that uh, after about 30 minutes of TV viewing, people almost automatically go off into alpha waves and <laughs> it just strains them. We, <laughs> we could comment quite a bit on television, but I don't dare do it in this particular medium. But uh, yeah, I, I'm sure a lot of us zone out when we're in front of a television and choosing between meditation and sleep might be difficult to do in, in a given circumstance. Um, but in any case, uh, what Wallace and Benson found, apropos of, of this alpha state and, and this new meditation that they now suddenly were able to document, is the fact that there are a couple of other changes that were particularly important. If you'll notice on the screen, for instance, oxygen consumption drops, not gradually over several hours, but almost immediately in meditation, and CO2 in the blood, as it turns out, rather than increasing as it does during sleep over the night, actually was reduced. That, combined with a number of the other observations, uh, essentially allowed them to conclude out of this study that transcendental meditation leads to a reduction in basic body metabolism that is controlled by the CNS. Question. I want to know, is it possible that you could actually meditate before you fall asleep? Because that, some, sometimes it may be noticeable that if you're trying to sleep but you never fall asleep and you end up waking up after a while. It feels like you haven't fallen asleep yet. You could potentially do so, yes. I'd, I'd never thought about that, but it, it would seem obvious that that might in fact occur, although it, generally it is thought that the alpha state is something that you pass through as you're falling asleep. Um, uh, but, but obviously that would be one of the strategies for potentially, I guess, getting yourself to fall asleep is to learn to meditate if, you, if you're just sitting there this way. Because as we all know, you can't go to sleep saying, go to sleep, you've got a big exam tomorrow, go to sleep, go to sleep. You have to just relax and let it happen. Um, so yes, in fact, I, it would not surprise me that that might be true. The conclusion, however, was that basically what's happening in meditation, Wallace and Benson concluded that in essence what you've got is a reduction in basic body metabolism, which explains a very interesting phenomenon that magicians had been aware of for years, and that is that Houdini used to, as one of his magic tricks, get himself chained up and then put in a trunk and thrown in the Hudson River or any river, and would stay down there for an amazingly long period of time. You and I, in four minutes in a closed trunk, would exhaust the oxygen supply in a panic. Apparently, what Houdini did was to meditate, so that as soon as he got the change un un unlocked, he then put himself into a state of meditation and simply stayed down there as long as he could, and then pulled on the chain and, and had himself brought back up uh, at the end. But it may have been meditation that explained how he could do it. Now, this having been concluded, we run into a rather interesting problem, and that is that, that basically David Holmes at the University of Kansas about five or ten years ago came out with a report that seriously challenged whether in fact meditation is in fact an independent state, or whether in fact what's actually going on is simply relaxation. Because what he did was invite participants to come into his laboratory, and then he just had them sit down in a chair and relax not go to sleep, not try to go to sleep, not try to put themselves into any kind of suspended animation or meditative state, but simply to relax. And his data indicates that he gets essentially the same measures that Wallace and Benson were reporting. And the net result is that there is a huge argument in the literature right now about whether meditation is really anything more than simply concentrated relaxation. Now, of course, me people who meditate have for years reported that it's a very relaxing state, that it produces a very relaxed feeling of, of contentment. 
But as Holmes points out, we live in such a rushed world these days that it may just be that you and I would get the same benefits as meditation if we actually just parked our fanny in a chair and relaxed for 20 or 30 minutes. And that in fact that's what he's basically arguing, that meditation is nothing more than relaxation. Now both meditation and sleep are physiologically measurable. That is, when somebody is meditating, we can measure things and tell you that I can separate physiologically somebody who's awake from somebody who's asleep from somebody who's meditating. Okay? What I cannot do is to provide an independent measure of somebody who says they are in a hypnotic state. Okay? Can't do that. And that leads to some rather interesting problems, as we'll see here for psychologists when we look at the final naturally altered state of, of um, consciousness. Number one, how do we do it? Well, in essence, in order to achieve um, hypnosis, in order to hypnotize somebody, first of all, you have to have somebody who can relax, who can, in fact, let go and relax. Not in the meditative sense, but just simply kind of get the muscle tension out of their body and allow themselves to relax. And allow is really the proper word there. The second thing that's necessary is trust. And I'll show you why here in just a minute. But in order to be a good hypnotic subject, basically you have to have somebody who trusts the hypnotist. And the third thing that has to be, um, has to be available is, in, in essence, an ability to, um, to follow suggestions. This is a third key. If you're able to relax, if you trust the person, and if you can follow suggestions, you then are a good potential subject for, for hypnotizing. There is, however, one caution that I want to sound for you. And that is that if you decide to try hypnosis at any point, um, make sure that you do trust the person and can trust the person that you're doing because uh, some introductory texts try to, to and, and others try to perpetuate the myth that in fact you can't be made to do anything when you're hypnotized that you wouldn't do normally. Baloney. There is evidence on record, published evidence, of, of a subject who was hypnotized and then had a, a vial of, of um, um, <laughs> blocking out the name, nitric acid put in front of them, just a vial of, of nitric acid put in front of them, and then right in front of the subject convinced them that it was nitric acid in addition to having them smell it. They just dropped a copper penny right into the, the nitric acid, and of course in standard basic chemistry form it just dissolved. I mean, it, it was absorbed, um, destroyed by the nitric acid. And then what they did was to distract the person who was hypnotized for a minute, and while they were distracted, what they did was to switch the nitric acid for a, a, a similar vial of, of uh, distilled water, completely neutral solution. And then what they did was to convince the person who was hypnotized that in fact the person sitting across the desk from them was an enemy agent of the United States. In modern times we would convince them simply that this was someone who was intent upon doing mayhem upon the, upon the U.S. and that in fact this was a traitor who was sitting across the desk from them. And in fact it was suggested that they really needed to be stopped at this point and the subject was ultimately convinced to pick up what they thought was nitric acid and toss it in the face of this other individual. If that doesn't convince you, about 15 years ago I went and watched a hypnotist perform here in the University Center on the, on the main campus here at the University of Houston and there were about 500 people in the room that night. It was a very well attended session. Um, and what he did was to talk a little bit about hypnosis and how it's achieved. Then he asked for volunteers. Um, now already you've kind of compromised what psychologists would be interested in because we would want to sample a random sample of people to see whether in fact hypnosis can be achieved. But he asked for volunteers, so we already had people who were kind of publicly committed to, to being hypnotized. In any case, he ended up with about 30. He selected about 15 men and 15 women and hypnotized them on stage and was successful in about two-thirds of the instances in, in getting about 10 of the men and 10 of the women hypnotized. The rest were um, excused and sent back out into the audience. But in essence, what he then did was about two hours of just hilarious different kinds of things with them. Um, one of the traditional ones that is, is uh, often demonstrated, um, if I could ask two of the people who are in the studio here to just get two chairs and put them opposite each other, just if one of you would get two of those chairs, put them on the stage opposite each other, I'll demonstrate one of the effects that can allegedly be achieved by um, hypnosis here in, um, in a minute. But in essence, um, what, what was done was to, um, was to basically, in this second instance, um, what they did was, was to, um, to hypnotize these people and have them go through a wide variety of different types of acts. At the end of the act, after about an hour and a half of, um, of having that done, thank you for that, um, what they did was, was to 
have the, they separated the men and the women. They had the women out in the audience um, going after something or other to get them off stage. What he did then with about 10 of these male undergraduates um, was to have them convinced that they were dancing at Le Bear. Uh, a nightclub here in Houston, uh, which features male nude dancers, and he convinced the men on stage that in fact there was a, a, a sexually crazed all-female audience that was watching them that was very interested in seeing their nude bodies as soon as possible. And in fact, in, in tune to, to strip tease music then, the men took off all their shirts on signal, they took off their socks, they took off their shoes, and several of them on suggestion were in the process of, of unbuckling and unzipping their pants and unbuttoning their pants, preparatory to taking them off. Now, before he actually stopped it. Now, if you want to argue with me and try to convince me that the average male undergraduate will disrobe in front of 500 colleagues on a stage in the UC, the, under, the university center, then you can convince me that in fact we can be made to do anything but only when we want to. I don't believe it, okay? So my caution is simply be careful before you actually uh, start trying to, to do hypnosis. Now in essence, the effects that can be achieved are quite interesting. Um, and widely varied. One thing is we can get you to dream on demand or we can suppress dreams. Either of them is, is achievable. Secondly, we can distort reality for you. We can get you to think that, that it's, it's very hot or very cold where you are. We can also um, interfere with or enhance your memory if we wish to do so. Um, and that's a third effect that we can, uh, that we can actually get. Um, it's because of that that hypnotically induced recovered memory is not normally allowed in a court of law in the U.S. Because in fact there is good evidence in, in some situations. We've been treated to a lot of cases recently where, where people are, not a lot, but some number, where, where um, children, once they become adults, are in therapy acknowledging or, or suggesting that they were molested by, by one or both of their parents, often many years earlier. That is a very controversial area, and there's some incontrovertible evidence that some of that is being achieved simply by implanted ideas from the therapist with the best of intentions, but with the wrong ultimate um, result. And that is that in some cases, memories may be implanted so effectively that they are recalled as if they were actual life events, even though in some instances it's been demonstrated that in fact the events could not have occurred. Um, so it, it turns out to be a very controversial area, but that's the reason that memory, um, that hypnotically induced memory is not allowed in, a, um, in a, um, a court of law in the U.S. at this point. While I'm getting up and preparing to do the other demonstration, does anybody have matches or a cigarette lighter? Because that's another demonstration I could do if, if anybody's got a pair. If you could put them up on the desk here, I'll demonstrate that in, um, in a minute. But in essence, what I want to do in the meantime is come over here and try a demonstration um, that involves, and you're going to have to pull out a little bit to, to show, to see what I'm going to do here. And I hope there's going to be enough room to do this on the, um, on the stage here. But in essence, one of the things that you allegedly get when you are hypnotized is superhuman strength. That, in fact, is a myth. Um, you now, if I can do this without falling off the edge of the stage here, I'll extend the other chair beyond. But what I'm going to do is to suspend myself across two chairs here. Okay? That's not a superhuman strength. Good thing we timed it the way we did there. Um, that it's, any of us can do that. It's just not the way we normally sit around at a, or lie around at a, at a cocktail party. Um, it's not superhuman to be able to suspend yourself that way. I actually saw um, the, the internationally known um, magician, whom I will not name, uh, do that trick recently and have on television nationally and have somebody sit on the waist of the person who was allegedly hypnotized, baloney. What actually happened was, if you looked, the edge of the chair was beyond, was above the knee, closer to the waist than the knee on, on, the, top, on the bottom end, and on the top end, the edge of the chair was down about chest level. So in fact, the only joint in the body that was supporting any weight was the waist, which is of course the strongest joint in the body anyway. So it can, it, that's essentially a stage hypnotic effect where you're creating the illusion as if there is some superhuman strength when in fact there may not be. Another thing that you allegedly get is superhuman uh, pain resistance. That is that you can, you can tolerate any amount of pain. And so I fry my hand here and in fact, if, uh, well, you saw me do it. There's a little bit of carbon on the, uh, on the hand at the moment uh, where I was running it. But in essence, that's nothing more than a basic birthday candle trick, the kind of thing you used to do at home when there were candles and at Thanksgiving or anything. You know, you remember you put your finger through the candle? 
you're doing exactly the same thing when you're running the cigarette lighter up and down your hand. The only difference is that you're moving the flame instead of your hand. You stop, you fry. Now, there's no doubt. But in essence, as long as the flame is moving, you're distributing the heat enough, any of us can do that. Okay? So you can create, in some cases, the illusion of hypnosis when in fact it is not there. And yet, um, Henry Kissinger, when he accompanied um, uh, Richard Nixon to China a number of years ago, um, suffered append uh, appendicitis. And they, it was uh, apparently, as it's described, it was serious enough that there was not time to fly him back to any U.S. military facility for Western medicine. So the only option he had was to be operated on under Eastern style, which normally involves something like hypnosis. You may have seen or heard radio ads here in Houston, for instance, of dentists that are, that are advertising uh, hypnodentistry or, or dentistry performed while hypnotized. Very effective pain support for those who can be hypnotized for those who can be hypnotized. And in the instance of Henry Kissinger, he was actually hypnotized. I mean, it's a choice between that or feel it, so I could probably be hypnotized then too. But in essence, he was hypnotized and the, the appendectomy was performed and he recovered um, and, and you know, lived through the experience without any reported pain at the, at the time. So it's a very powerful phenomenon, but we don't have a good handle on it because there's no independent measure that is available. There are actually three different theories as to what is actually going on uh, in terms of the, the, um, the explanation for what, what we're actually trying to find or, or whether there is in fact a hypnotic effect. Martin Orne, recently deceased, has argued for years that in essence all hypnosis represents is a response to demand characteristics. And he's been able to demonstrate that for youngsters, um, children, adults for that matter, who, who believe, you know, read something that, that suggests that their eyes will normally be open when they're hypnotized, lo and behold, in fact, their eyes are open when they're hypnotized. For those who've read something that suggests that the eyes are normally closed when they're hypnotized, then in fact their eyes are closed when they're hypnotized. But the fact is that he has some evidence to suggest that it's nothing more than a response to demand characteristics. The theory that I really prefer is the one of T.X. Barber, a, a um, psychologist in, in uh, Massachusetts, who argues basically that it represents what is called hyper-suggestibility or a significant response to, to suggestion, that people who are very good at responding to suggestion um, are the best hypnotic subjects. Um, related to that, um, Jack Hilgard at, um, whoops, I'm doing goofy things here. Um, Jack Hilgard, well, I guess I'm not gonna be able to show you Hilgard's name, that's the third one. Um, Hilgard was able to develop what is called the Stanford Hypnotic Susceptibility Scale, or SHSS, which turns out to be a very effective measure of, um, of, of a subject's ability to actually be, um, actually be hypnotized. In essence, um, what he has is a whole series. There are about 10 or 12 graded tests, one of which will give you an idea of what's involved. He suggests in the Stanford Hypnotic Susceptibility Scale to measure somebody's hypnotizability that what you do is have the person extend their hands outward this way. And then you have to the hand that is palm down, you, you have them close their eyes and imagine that what's been attached to this hand is a helium-filled balloon, a large helium-filled balloon, which is kind of tugging the hand upward, okay? You imagine, have the subject imagine in the other hand that they're holding a 16-pound bowling ball. And then you have them just imagine that, boy, that bowling ball is really getting heavy. It's arm's length, it's really heavy. And what you've done is simply create a perfect dependent variable because all you have to do is measure the amount of separation that you're able to achieve and figure that, you know, the, the bigger the separation, the easier this person will be to hypnotize. And in fact, that's about where we are at this point. We don't know. There's no specific way to, um, to independently um, uh, measure or document the existence of hypnosis actually occurring at this point. And because of that, we're not sure whether we actually have a legitimate phenomenon here or not. There is a lot that we, um, that we still have to learn about what actually constitutes hypnosis. Now, that's as far as the first test is going to cover. For those of you that are watching this in TV land, the test is likely to fall on the, the first Friday following the broadcast of this tape. Um, and we will attempt to make that happen from now on in, in perpetuity. In the meantime, what we're going to do is go on into our next, um, our next segment here, uh, which involves specifically the study of, of um, sensory processes. One of the first difficulties that we run into when we start studying sensory processes is basically a problem in defining what we mean by sensation. We've got a lot of different potential definitions for that, and since they're all in your simple psych book, I'm not, not going to spend a lot of time going over them. But I do want to point out 
that in essence the, the um, sensation itself or sensation and perception are normally thought of as distinct events and I think that's a mistake. I think it's better in general if we think of a sensation as an incoming process or an incoming stimulus that's okay. And likewise, if we look at perception, we can think of perception essentially as, as a, a kind of a result, a consequence, an, an, an outcome. The problem is that the relationship between sensation and perception is actually quite complex. For instance, if we want to think of stim sensation as incoming stimuli and perception as the result, the, the, the result of interpretation, of, implying exper of applying experience to incoming stimuli and leading to an interpretation or a perception, you've got the following problem. I can show you in the eye cells that fire only when you're moving in a given direction. And so what happens is cell A fires, then cell B fires, and then cell C fires but cell C fires only if B and A have, precedingly, have preceded it in firing. Okay? And so what that means is that when cell C fires, it tells you by definition that's an object that's moving in this direction. Okay? The problem is that if that same object moves in this direction, cell C does not fire because cell B and cell A have not previously fired. Okay? So the problem is, for purposes of defining sensation and perception, that even in the very act of firing, that cell has already given you perceptual information. That is, it's already told you this is an object that's, that's not moving this way, it's moving this way. So I think a better way to, to differentiate sensation and perception is to think of them essentially as anchoring points on a, I'm trying to put the hands on screen, um, as anchoring different points on a continuum. That yes, sensory processes are at one end, uh, well, I should do it the other way for you since you're viewing me backwards. Sensory processes are at one end and perceptual processes are at the other, but there's a kind of a gray border defining the separation between sensation and perception in the, um, on, the, um, on the continuum that we're, um, that we're looking at. Now, um, there are basically three different views about what's going on perceptually um, in, the, in our world of, of perception and sensation. The oldest view is the absolutist view. What the absolutists are arguing essentially is that you and I in interpret the real world as it actually occurs, amen. Okay? Extremists in this would be arguing that what's inside us is light and that sound and light are actually rattling around inside us ultimately being interpreted in some kind of a television screen or radio receiver. Not so. Almost nobody in modern times adopts an absolutist view. More likely, what you will have is what we we'll call a dualist view. The dualists are essentially arguing that um, what we have is two different systems that are operating in parallel to each other. We have first of all the real world of physical events outside us and then secondly we have the neural recreation that is N-E-U-R-A-L that the events of the outside world are represented within us in our nervous system and that that neural system is a recreation of what's going on in the outside world. Now think about that for a minute because in essence what that's doing is raising some very interesting issues um, that we're going to actually be grappling with here over the next week or ten days. Specifically, what it's arguing is that sound or light for instance is not, you know, I've got a lot of lights that are shining on me to, to keep me bright enough so that I can be photographed here, but what it's arguing is that light does not exist out there. Light is the product of our mind. That is, the neural system that reacts to those electromagnetic radiations is what creates light. But the light is literally a creation of our mind. It does not exist out in the world there. What does exist out there between those lights and me, or between my image and the television camera that's recording it, is nothing more than electromagnetic radiation, period. That's the reason the dualist view is, is maintained and with some degree of, of justification. That is, that, it, that in essence what we argue is that, that the light, and, and I'll be able to show you demonstrations here where, our, where we actively misperceive things. Not today, but certainly in the next lecture. I'll have several demonstrations where you're going to actively misperceive things. And I'll show you, and I'll show you that it's a misperception, and you will believe. Net result then is that the dualist view is essentially arguing that we have the, the external world of physical characteristics and we have the internal world of psychological attributes. They're separate but unequal. They're correlated but they are in fact separate. That's the dualist view. 
And thirdly then, we can look at the role of, um, of um, social consensus. And that is the, the point that's being made there basically is that to a certain extent, you and I see and hear what others have reported seeing and hearing. That is, social factors do impact our ability to perceive things. Does it not strike you as strange that in essence, reports of, of unidentified flying objects don't tend to occur over the skies of Houston. They're more likely to be reported by two Nebraska farmers that have been out in their fields drinking for six or eight or ten hours of some Saturday evening. And about three in the morning on Sunday, one of them reports a kind of a shimmering, hovering blue thing over on the horizon there. It may be the reflection of the light of, of the nearest town, but in fact it gets worked up to the other one sees it all of a sudden, gee, it is there. And then pretty soon they've manufactured yellow things that are spouting out of it. It becomes a hovering blue thing that sucks up a cow and departs. And then they go in and try to report it to the sheriff. I'm going to argue that all that is is essentially social consensus. That both of them were drunk enough that, that whatever perceptual phenomena they saw got remanufactured in the minds of both of them into some major significant event for which there's no evidence and never will be any. Because in fact it didn't occur. It was only in the minds of, of, the, um, of the subject. Another example, if a rumor ever gets started of you, about you, you're helpless. In essence, what happens is word sweeps around that this, that, or the other thing is true of you, and the, the consuming public essentially assumes that the rumor is true, and then interprets your behavior in terms of that rumor. We'll look at that more down in the social psych section of the course, but in essence, that's the social consensus element that impacts the way you and I are perceived. To a certain extent, we are a product, our perception is a product of the, the social beliefs of the others around us. There's a, there was an incident here in Houston a couple of years ago where several, um, I think it was sophomores, if I remember, it was a fairly young class in a high school athletic class, fainted. And in fact, it was not one, several people fell out. Um, and what was happening was, as near as I remember, one student was found to have been, had heat prostration or something like that. But a number of others said, gee, if that person fainted, maybe I should faint. And in essence, all you had was a social infection effect that was, that was going on there. One person fainted for legitimate medical reasons, and several others fainted for social reasons. That's the thing to do. Okay, I'll faint. But in essence, that also tends to impact the way we perceive things. I'm on a stump. I'll get off it. Um, let's look at three, um, at some issues that also relate to, to, um, to um, our social perception here, or perception generally. One of the attempts to explain perception involves the invention of what's called a homunculus. If you can believe it, Bell Telephone, a number of years ago, had a, a show on national television in which they were describing vision, and they actually had a mechanism exactly like you see on the screen here, a great big human head with a little guy inside watching television. The, the use of the old-fashioned television set there is deliberate to hint that this was a very dated theory. The problem with this particular mechanism is that all it does is, is to pose two very significant problems for us. <coughs> First of all, does that mean that there's a little guy inside the head of the little guy that we see here? And do we then essentially have to reduce this infinite numbers of times to get to the ultimate little guy? And a second problem, which is, is even more obvious, is that if this is being proposed to explain how vision works, then the problem we're left with is, okay, how do the eyes of the little guy inside work? And so in essence, all we've done is add one additional level of complexity to us um, if we try to, to mount this kind of an explanation. So a homunculus basically does not work. Let me suggest as one possible reason why this, um, why this may have occurred is that I can ask you to focus on my nose, okay? Look at my nose, but, but focus on what my finger is doing, okay? And I can in fact trace quite a pattern around me before I bring my finger back to my nose. And in fact, you could process both. You look at my nose, but you're actually attending to what my finger was doing as it was wandering around me, okay? It may be the confusion to, in that difference that may have led to the, the creation of, of the homunculus. Uh, but the point is that, that we can in fact focus on something, but attend to something else. Those are separable processes. <coughs> and it may be that confusion over that is what led to the idea of the homunculus, but scratch it. There is no little guy, little gal inside grinding buttons for us. Um, it is, in fact, a direct neural system that we're operating with. Um, the second thing that we can look at is, is also to talk about the stimuli that we're actually going to use here. What I'm going to do is to limit my discussion to 
only stimuli for which we are adequately designed. That is, I'm going to talk about only what are called adequate stimuli, stimuli for which the systems that we're going to look at are designed to receive. To give you an example of an inadequate stimulus, if you will feel on your eye, there's a V-shaped notch of bone right over at the side of your eye. I'd like you to take a pencil, close the eye, take a pencil, eraser end, and just jab your eye. Okay? And if you do that, you shut your eye, use the, I don't want your eyeball out on a pencil here. I want you to just use the eraser end with the eye shut and just tap the eye. And what do you experience with that eye shut? What do you actually experience? Pain. Pain. You're stabbing too hard. <laughs> what, do, what do you experience? It isn't dark purple, it's more general than that. It's a flash of light, but it, that is, in fact, what will happen. Okay, if you're looking straight ahead and you, and you tap your eye, what you'll experience, if the tap is on this side, the flash will be over on the other side. Okay, come back to me for a minute. Um, if the tap is on the right side, in the right eye, the, the light flash that you experience will be on the left side. Okay, we're going to talk about why that occurs later. But that flash of light is one example of a response of the visual system from an eye that is not adequately designed to interpret taps. And what, ha what happened is that all you did was to take the, the, the cells in the receptor surface that were just below threshold and you jarred them and what happened is you made them super threshold and so they spiked. And so you will experience a flash of light. That's an example of a stimulus source that the eye is not set up to adequately interpret, but it does occur. Okay. Let's look now at specifically something called how many senses do we have? It almost sounds like a um, uh, Tonight Show kind of pro probe for you. I have nothing to do with this slide. I just like the picture, so I put it on anyway. But how many senses do we actually have? Guesses from the class. How many senses do we actually have? Five. That's the traditional number, yes. Six. I'm hearing another nomination for eight. Who'd like to go for ten? Eleven. Twelve. In fact, that's probably the actual correct number. Let me suggest to you a couple of reasons why. First of all, the sense of touch is actually four separate senses. Hot, cold, touch, and pressure. I can show you specific demonstrations for each of those four different receptors. We've got some others that haven't been mentioned there. For instance, if I sit in this chair and am turned repeatedly, okay, <laughs> oh, that'll be fun, um, I end up being dizzy. Dizzy is not mentioned in any of the senses you, men you mentioned, and yet it is a detector. We have a detector for motion, okay? We have another detector for body position, position. I am willing to bet that if I were to point to any one of you, I could ask you to describe for me the position of your body, and you could do so if I already had you shut your eyes before doing the actual description, okay? It is the case that each of those is, de is depicting or th the result of a different body system. So we actually have, I'm going to argue, closer to a dozen actual senses um, rather than anything uh, as simple as, as just five or just six. Now, let's look at how we're going to start trying to track down what's going on psychologically inside us. That puts us into an area or an investigation called psychophysics. Psychophysics basically represents the interface between the physical world of actual external physical characteristics and the internal psychological world of experience. Okay? That world of experience is in essence what we are going to study when we look at psychophysics. And to study psychophysics, well let me give you a specific example here before we actually start looking at, at um, um, the absolute threshold. Have you ever bought a 50, 100, 150 watt light bulb? taken it home and screwed it into the lamp and then turn it on, the jump from no light to 50 watts of light is quite detectable. You crank it from 50 to 100 and you've got a kind of an increase in, in, um, in, in I mean it's a detectable increase, but the jump from, a, from 100 to 150 watts of wat light sometimes gives you the impression, impression that you've actually not gotten your money's worth out of that light bulb. Therein lies the reason why we have psychophysics. And in essence, what we're talking about there is the fact that the physical increment in going from 50 to 100 to 150 is an exactly equal physical increase in energy. It does not yield a comparably equal increase in psychological experience. That's the reason we need a world like psychophysics. And in psychophysics, then, if we study something like an absolute threshold, that is basically the intensity level at which you can detect a stimulus 
half of the time when it is actually presented to you. The absolute threshold then is measured, or that is what we measure, using the method of limits when we're testing something like um, your hearing threshold. We're going to use some ascending series where we make the sounds progressively louder and some descending series. Those are basically attempts to correct two different types of errors that we may experience. Perseveration, saying it too long, or anticipation. We'll pick it up next time.